But the buttons were, were live. The recording is in progress. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yeah, we, we 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 have a tendency here to just start talking and then we forget to hit the record button. <laughs> okay. We, we have. I was thinking of a great point because Jonathan was talking about uh, axioms and, and, and different faiths and is it is it always going to be is it fair to say a zero sum game where if my faith is this therefore my politics are this and I think it's fair that we can do the separation. Um, and, and, and not trounce on each other's beliefs. Everybody knows I'm Jewish anyway uh, from, from my YouTube uh, videos. On I, I, I haven't ever actually... Like, right, see, like you pointed out in my video that I turned everything into economics. Oh, yes. You know, so, see, I think at the end of the day, that's not not to not to say a Jewish stereotype, but I think your true <laughs> religion is economics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's just start off with, I guess, um, uh, the topics we're going to try to stick with are the Republican primary candidates, and then we're going to get into some other topics, which because of course they bring up what they believe in, whether it's taxes or. Um, actually, including God, um, to uh, you know, social issues, what, whatnot. So, uh, Jonathan's our guest this show, so he can start off. Okay. All right. So yeah. So I was talking about the axioms and stuff like that. And basically, once you have an axiom, I mean, you basically set up a foundation where everything is derived from. And I mean, I'm not saying the axioms are, are wrong or anything. It's just that I'm saying that if you have a wrong axiom, everything else is irrelevant. You're basing all your information based um, off of an incorrect axiom. So I think that in order for us to derive uh, conclusions or more, how should I call it, more correct theories, would be to have a mixture of empiricism and, and logic, which would be, of course, scientific method. Sure. I, I, I tend to agree with that. However, the extreme uh, augmentation of that, of course, you, you wind up with uh, the zeitgeist. Which is actually the other. Uh, we have another person who may be joining us in future shows. It, it will have a zeitgeist, so we'll definitely have a diverse. It, I, I think you would serve as the middle ground, and Marcel, of course, being the pure fundamentalist uh, economist, we would definitely have the economic spectrum covered. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I'm. I can see the virtues of all, but at the end of the day, I, I tend to favor respecting the individual's right to choose, even if they choose to disagree. Uh, but th th that gets into like what you were talking about with axioms, uh, and that's a fundamental thing in, in everything, whether it's your economics, your theological, your philosophical philosophy, your political philosophies. Um, you know, you're, you're creating an axiom for, for yourself, defining right and wrong, correct, wrong side of the line, yada yada, uh, and, you know, ask a hundred people, you get a hundred answers to the hundred questions. Uh, well, I think what he's getting at, though, with the axiom is that whether something is self-evident to you, the, to, let's not, let's not make, consume the show based on something that's self-evident versus, okay, let's bring some real uh, logic and, and, and empirical data and real data to the table to support that. Point. I guess is that in that what you're getting at, Jonathan? Yeah, because I mean, you can say, okay, well, there's an invisible hand in the free market, and logically speaking, I mean, everything is going to be spontaneous, right? Everything's going to sure. fit, but there's no empiricism, you know, empirical evidence off of that. Absolutely. So, so then it's kind of like you know, with the God thing that I was getting at, that if you say, okay, well, God exists, He's this invisible force that manages everything, and I mean, you should behave good because then after you die, this is going to happen. Then you're be, it's like you don't know 100% if that if God exists, like you want him to exist, but I guess the invisible head, I mean... We're not going to have any arguments here that just just because we say so it is the, the absolute truth. So I think that's what we'll... Well, and, and, and like I, I agree with your uh, with your your point of view there, one hundred percent. But the thing is, on some of the on the most interesting questions, particularly you know the whole God, no God, you know, right religion, wrong. Right. Russ, you're getting the socialist. Okay, so you're taking it more literal. Well, no, no, but I mean, I mean, on anything, like I, I, ideally, you try and stick to. I, I'm just using that because that's the example he used. I I will make sure. That we all use uh, credible arguments if we if we get too far off and that there's no self-evident truths. Oh there. no no we have to. I was just going to make the comment on that. 
I, I always favor sticking to empirical data. However, uh, there's that old adage, you can use statistics to prove anything. Sure. And, and, and empirical data, depending how you present it, okay. can... Well, my, that's why I said that it has to be a mixture. Of, because, I mean, when you go with logic, you can say, okay, well, God made us, therefore, logically speaking, you know, we're his creation. Or you can say, or you can have another person be empirical, side, which says, um, I saw a person flying the other day, therefore all humans fly. But... He didn't see everything. I mean, it could have been a person who launched sure. out of the planet, you know what I mean? So you got to have, like, a uh, connection between logic and uh, empirical evidence. Well, okay. I mean, you going to have to work on this. Well, let's move to a topic. That's actually what... Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Mark, uh, bit that's a politically loaded topic we're on right there, and it's actually yeah. one of the. Uh, oh, we're in theory. We're in theory. I want to get more. I want to get more. Uh, okay. Uh, since we said Republican candidates, let's pick yes. one and start with them. Uh, I, we, we we gave the whole last three hours to Rick Perry, so how about we start with someone else? <laughs> I know, but, but, okay, Jonathan and I are discussing, we're discussing, because the Young Turks had something on Perry's plan. Okay. The only reason why I like Perry, the, uh, 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 well, no, I have a couple reasons. One, I live under his policy. I know the man. He, suck, he does suck at things. But the thing that makes him powerful, in my view, is not about all the national stuff. The man is a state's rights person. He's not a I, 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 I had a thought on that, actually. I, 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 I have a question for you on that, because that's okay. one of the reasons you love him. No, let, me, let me finish. A state's rights person doesn't necessarily mean they're always for limited government. Perry does a lot of social programs in the state of Texas. Okay, Part, Like, people would, would rag on Texas education being lost. Well, those, those programs that measure education are on four-year terms. And Texas is loaded with a lot of English sec as a second language courses, of which those people are never going to get through four years. Well, no, and we, we went into that in the last show, yeah. but my, my, my question is, because you brought that up, do you think Perry is pro-states' rights because at this time he is a representative for a state? Do you think if he became president that he'd do a 180 on that because then it's in his best interest to be anti-state, pro-fed? Well, well, see, the thing of it is, is that we've had the governors argue. We've had other argue, uh, govern, uh, governors debate, and none of them use states' rights as one of their as one of their main pillars. And in the debates, a lot of people that goes over their head because states' rights is not really a common topic in the United States. That's actually what makes us extremely powerful as a country: is states' rights, which is part of the, the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution which is, enables us to better tailor our economics to demographics that, de that demand a more specific coverage. I can say, let's make universal health care in the United States, but that would be a very general blanketing program for, let's say, California, which is extremely different from Wyoming, which is then very different from Vermont. And, and that's the point of what I'm saying with, with Perry. If it's states' rights, I don't have a, a, that big of a problem with government when it's getting closer and closer to the individual, because I don't subscribe to the to the to the chaotic um, theory of total individualism at every level. Because uh, we live in cities for a reason. It's like I tell my friend who is total anarchist. I was like, well, then if you really are of your position, go build your own windmill. Grow your own food in your backyard. Cut your sewage from everything. Build your own septic tank. And you know, it's like we live in cities for a reason. And, and get the ten thousand dollars in fines. <laughs> because we want a common denominator of things, and that's why I say I am limited. I am for limited government. But when government gets much more personal to me, then we are arguing things. Because why? Why do I support that? It's because it's it's catering to me more so. It's it's it is it is much more my business at that level than it is at the national. Well, okay, but at that level, you're dealing with either a local town or county bureaucrat that's within fifty miles of you, as opposed to somebody who's in Washington D.C. who's yes. never set foot in your town. Hey, but their first strength, they're much smaller. Their fundamental power is much more limited, and my voting base and what in which we want to vote for things becomes more micro versus macro. 
the, the, the major strength that I give Perry, and that's, he's, and that's it, now if he deviates from states' rights at any time, he's finished with me. Because the strength that he has with me is his, his, his position of taking a lot of power from the federal and giving states the ability to manage their own problems in a better way versus some federal uh, authority saying, no, you're doing it wrong, when the federal authority has no idea what's happening in that state and letting that state carry its business in the best way it sees fit and giving it the power to do that. So that's number one why I support Perry on a lot of things. Is, does he have a lot of corruptive arguments that have happened? Sure. A lot of that has been actually hashed in three terms that he's won in Texas, that a lot of these things are very old that are, that are getting uh, recropped up. But the last election, I, I voted for Ron Paul. I like Ron Paul. I've always really been a Ron Paul fan except for two issues on his competing currency. And I don't always agree with this foreign policy because I definitely believe that if you wait till the problem is on your front lawn, many times it's too late. But, well, and Ron uh, Paul also strongly supports the uh, uh, the tenth and states making up their own mind and so yeah. forth. So that that's that's my quick synopsis of the two candidates that I support. It's it's Perry or Ron Paul, pretty well, much. Let me, say, let me say two things. Uh, well, related to your individualism, right? If you want to wait until you you said that uh, you can't wait until it goes to your front lawn, right? But who are you to go into another person's country and say I'm going to be proactive about my country and your country? It doesn't make any sense. True, but that's it. That now that, that the thing of it is, is being preemptive. We we just don't go in without a cause. So it could be argued. Uh, right. that's not one hundred percent true, and that and that he's brought up a good point. The reality yeah. on that is, and this and this is an issue, even though we're wandering a little bit, wait, wait, is wait, that wait, wait. It, it? Well, no, no. It, it it's a it, there's it's a lose lose on both sides. If you go out and and act in your best interest in other countries. You're acting in your best interest in somebody else's sovereign country. If if you don't do it at all, you wait till the problems show up on your desk on your doorstep. At which point, it's too late to really do anything about it. You're misapplying what I'm discussing. For instance, preemptive is what we 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 do a lot of. For instance, we make alliances with other countries that want our presence there. Let's bring up Europe, Europe versus Russia. Russia doesn't want our missile systems there, but Europe does. Europe invited us on their sovereign territory to physically place there. We did not intrude. And Europe does not want the U.S. to back down from the Russian talks about the missile, the missile shield system. Now, let's yeah, talk about... But, but that's wait, wait, wait. Let me get into Iraq. We had the legal authority... Oh, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Mar Marcel, before you... Because Europe... The situation in Europe and the situation in Iraq are very different situations. Yes, I know, can can, can we let him do his response to Europe, then we get into Iraq? Fine, fine. John? No, no. Okay. okay. All right. Here, here's what I'm talking about. Iraq. Now, Iraq started in 91 at the behest of Saudi Arabia requesting us, actually desperately asking us to go there and protect him, them from Saddam Hussein. That is actually what pissed off Osama bin Laden is because when he had the Mujahideen, of Deen, which we, I have totally admit, we, we educated the man, his entire military, we armed them and did everything because we, we, were, we were financing a way to stop the Soviets from getting a warm water submarine port. That was a whole uh, Soviet conquest of Afghanistan. They wanted to get a, to a warm water part, port to berth submarines because they were their submarines stuck out like you know baby rattles in cold water. So they were, they were frustrated that they, they couldn't get past our, 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 naval, our naval grid. So we did. We made Osama bin Laden the, 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 the military badass he was in Afghanistan and shut down the Soviet occupation. At the same time, his, bin Laden's beliefs in Saudi Arabia, he was always at odds with the monarchy. Okay, And the monarchy does have trouble maintaining the Saudi population. It's, look, I can tell you, I've been in a lot of intelligent, uh, intelligence uh, gatherings uh, without without violating information that there is always turmoil going on between what the monarchs want and what a tremendous amount of their population wants in the direction of, of Saudi government. Nonetheless, we used the Saudi government to dump the price of oil to crush the Soviet economy. You can, if you want to read up on that, there's a book called Victory, how Ronald Reagan used economics to, to crush the Soviet economy. We, and you can actually track it in statistical data how we dumped the price of oil 
that crushed the Soviet GDP because they were a huge oil export. But what did the Saudis do? They spent all the money. They went in debt. And so then they became even more dependent on the United States. And we created a vicious beast where they separated themselves from the population further and created this hostile schism between the beliefs of Osama bin Laden's Mujahideen and the, the, the Saudi government. So when bin Laden is trying to make amends with the Saudi government and saying, I have a badass army, I can go and I can go there and I can successfully defend you from Saddam Hussein and I'll be there, you know, in X, Y, and Z date, whatever, the Saudi government told him, No, go to hell, you're disconnected from us, and we want the Americans to come. This is why Al Qaeda targeted Saudi Arabia first on all the bombs. He hated the alliance and the dependence that Saudi Arabia had on the United States of government in terms of their geopolitical and financial interests. And but that is not our fault that the Saudis spent all of their damn money on oil production. We're not responsible for saying, damn, you went into debt, why are you, you know, spending I mean, who are we to say how you should how they should spend their money? Nonetheless it created a problem. So here here it comes Iraq invades and we go and then we have we know the Gulf War. The Gulf War actually ends on a ceasefire. Where if Iraq violates any part of that ceasefire, we are legally able to resume war. There is no, there is no anything else other than the ceasefire that existed. The UN got involved and said, "Fine, you know what? We'll try to enforce and help it keep it peaceful." So we created the no-fly zones. We created like these inspections for for, for the uh, Shiite and the Kurdish populations of Iraq, and this went on for years. Now. The thing of it is, is we had UN inspectors in there for quite a while. Now we come to 1998. Bill Clinton's president. Saddam Hussein says, F you to the UN and everybody in there, and basically kicks UN inspectors out. Okay? The no-fly zone has a hard time being enforced at this point, and basically President Clinton, against what the UN wanted, initiated what we call Operation Desert Fox against Iraq, with the UK to bomb Iraq as, as far back as we could. And it's, it, that, that's where we get what we call the UNSCOM report. That's what everything was based on in the, in the 2000 to 2003 ramp up to the, uh, to the Iraqi war. So UNSCOM, this UNSCOM report is all of, the, all of the counting of weapons of mass destruction and all of this other shit that was in Iraq um, when they were kicked out. So, now we have President Bush, which could have been President Gore. It didn't matter who it was. This top, the Iraqi conflict was going to escalate no matter who was president. That's what people don't understand is because the events that took place in 1998 sealed the deal for us to go to war sometime within maybe a three to four year period afterwards. And it's because in 1998 we left so many things exposed. We were losing the no-fly zones because the UN was getting a lot of support to cancel the no-fly zones. The Kurds were bitching, the Shiites were bitching because the Baathists were going to have a tremendous amount of power over, over, over the whole country. So basically, we get President Bush in, who happened to land in this situation. Nobody ever talks about the ramp up of military that we were allowed in Turkey, with the Saudi Arabia, with Saudi Arabia allowed on their own homeland. And within their waters, nobody ever... The news never covers this kind of crap. You, you mean armchair quarterbacking isn't accurate? Yeah, they, they really? Never this kind of shit that actually goes on, you know? So, so basically, we get, to, we get to the point where we actually have intelligence and the UNSCOM report. All Bush is doing is saying, here's a UN report from 1998. We have this checklist that they say cannot be verified, that have been destroyed. We have this intelligence reports coming in that the entire world agreed with. So, they, the, at that point, Hans Blitz goes in. We send this UN team. Hans Blitz can't find anything, right? And what does Hans Blitz do? He writes a book that I remember his quote quite, quite perfectly where he says, well, we can't find them, therefore the weapons must not exist. What kind of logic is that to say, because you can't find them, they don't exist? How can this come from a man when in the Gulf War in 1991, Iraq was known for creating the most scud missile decoys, known the man that 
They could, we hit more decoys than real spent missile launch sites than known to man. Why? Because Iraq had the most elaborate underground system to remove scud missiles and pop them up at the last minute and launch a scud missile only to cloak it back underground and move logistics. How, how can you totally dismiss something as very important as saying, we don't have proof that they've been destroyed and we don't know where the hell they are, but yet we're just going to dismiss it and say, who gives a shit? To me, it was total non sequitur. But... Well, okay, that's the logic fallacy. Absence of absence of evidence is not evidence yeah, of absence, exactly, anyways. Exactly. But the problem that I had with the way Bush went about it was he was under legal terms of the ceasefire from the Gulf War to say we can resume war. He didn't have to go into uranium deposits and what was left over from 1998. Iraq was still in violation of the ceasefire. By law. We could have resumed the ceasefire and kicked the shit out of them at any fucking time. I'm cussing. Them, at any time that they had violated that ceasefire, so we had an agreement that was agreed that was agreed to. We sent in, even though we didn't abide by that ceasefire, because we obviously sent in Hans Blitz with the UN team and the and the nuclear agency and all this other crap went in there. We actually put in a tremendous amount of layers before we ramped up to war to actually finally attacking Iraq. So, if you want to call that preemptive and unauthorized entry, I have a severe problem with it in terms of how the events led to where we were in Iraq. I don't give a crap if it was Bush or Gore. If this would have happened, we would have come to either another Operation Desert Fox or what we did in Iraq. The only problem with I have with Iraq is how we executed it. Why did we go in Afghanistan and we, and we handed the we backed up the Mujahideen with air support and we got rid of the Taliban? We had very little troops in terms of the real movements of removing the Taliban. I think that, that the Afghan war was a CIA uh, controlled war. Iraq was a Department of Defense controlled war, and I'll and explain that. Dick Cheney, whom I don't, who is not really a favorite politician of mine, has a beef with the CIA. And he actually went as far as empowering an agency called the Department of uh, DIA. Basically, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency became an arm to even counter the Department of State. This is how much disdain Cheney actually had for the CIA in muddled things in, in Iraq, in my opinion, because there were two very different executions. You have the Afghan war, we handed power over to the Afghanis, and then you have the Iraq war, where we put Bremer in, and it's like U.S. control. Hell, hell no. Why, why are you doing one country correctly one way and Iraq the other way? So when we talk about preemptive, let's be careful, because I know Iraq is used as like this preemptive thing and how dare we do all this stuff, when most people are actually just naive to how we got to that position. So, I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with preemptive as in... There's this probable cause, right? And then you go and do something about it. I don't have a problem with that. I, but I do have a problem with a country saying, okay, look, we need help or something like that. Let's, you know, just bring your troops here because we need to develop our country. It's like, that's not our problem to develop your country. That's your problem. That's why you're your own country. And then on top of that, then keeping troops stationed in worldwide bases, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Well, I'll tell you why we do that. In part, we have troops from other nations here. There's a lot of collaboration. It's not... Ron Paul puts in a position that we're wasting tax dollars in those efforts. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interdependency that we now have militarily with other parts of the world that we learn from them, they learn from us. My brother-in-law, for instance, my brother-in-law, for instance, uh, is a Marine. He is he was part of a uh, foreign military training unit. He went to Colombia, and Colombia has you know has a problem with foreign, uh, and and and, and they have that political. Uh, back and forth that goes on with the guerrillas that, that attack the Colombian government. But nonetheless, he goes in, which the Marines have, this is a very new thing to the Marines, foreign military training unit. It's more kind of like, it's kind of like a, a civil affairs with a Delta Force component uh, of bringing civ you know, civility and infrastructure along with the military training aspect of it to combat your problem. When countries ask us to do that, there is a collaborative effort. I mean, we can say no to them. Uh, but it is a very real thing of which, of which, Jonathan, I think you'll find that as we discuss more that, yes, I am for the individual and can put nations as individual, 
there is a point uh, where I use, where I do agree that we need to help. It's just how we go about it and what opportunity costs are lost in terms of the price that we pay. And in terms of the, when we're training the Colombian government, we get we get back we get back in part a stable government that that basically helps us as a as a as a trading partner. We we also have them to help us keep other governments that they trade with happy. Because the problem is, is that if we do truly have countries that are always on the edge of turmoil, that all countries want to trade with, not just the United States, but take Venezuela. Venezuela, we don't like to interfere with, so much, but we're worried right now, and the rest of the world is worried right now because of the health of, of, of Chavez. Even though we, we principally disagree with them, if we have instability with it, how, how, how far is it instability going to going to come to the cost of where it costs the other trade partners of, of, of Venezuela and Europe, the trading that we have with Venezuela as well. I mean, we, we, we play these risks off, and that's where preemptive comes in, and it and also has an economic model where we can bring it more to, to what we discuss in domestic policies. Well, there is a line of drawing the sand, though. Right. Well, connected to that, I mean, yeah, you have the individual of both three that we believe in the individual and stuff like that, but we also both agree from what you're saying. That, you know, we are connected, everybody. You know? Absolutely, we are connected. Well, and th that, that goes into um, another issue that is really ultimately at the end of the Like I said, it's a lose-lose on both sides. Really, until we do with something that Marcel's actually said before, and until we separate the concept of a, a border of a nation is a security issue, not a trade issue, uh, not a trade or immigration issue, it's a security issue. Uh, but right now, they're all interlocked. Immigration, trade, and border security are all interlocked, and we, we, we don't, we don't uh, basically, like you're saying, uh, one of the aspects, that the, the aspects for interfering are, like you're saying, uh, regarding things, and the other thing is economic stability. And at the end of the day, uh, other countries, not just the United States, if it if it's going to create something that creates economic instability that affects them, they really don't care that it's on somebody else's soil. They're going to get involved because it's in their best interest. Uh, and until we can separate the borders from the global economy, because the reality is we're in a global economy, regardless of Absolutely. how patriotic we are. You and are. I think the protectionism that gets involved where we all want to be isolated from each other. We all can benefit from each other economically. It's how we do those transactions that comes under scrutiny with me. It's how those transactions that we are connect connected come into scrutiny. You know, it's like Libya, for instance. You know why we're in Libya? We were, we were there because the French asked us to be. Now, you're not going to hear that in any news outlets or anything. And I'm sure that struck a chord with you because you're French. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, I mean, are born U.S., but yes, I went two generations off are French. But what I'm what I'm saying is that I, I don't think the I think I don't think France has a lot of smart things at all in terms of economics. But nonetheless, what I'm saying is that France has backed us up on a lot of things. This is a this Libya is totally a French interest, uh, and has and really Germany was trying to get involved as well, and and. It's funny, we always had sanctions that we couldn't do trade with Libya while France and Germany did. And they so we trade with France. France. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, nobody talks about that. It's always the evil U.S. Oh, but, but when the U.S. tries to do something moral and saying we don't want to trade with Libya because of the conditions they have, France and Germany, they get off the hook with the media, even though they're totally exploiting the economy of Libya at the same time while we say we're not going to participate because of X, Y, and Z reasons, which have to do with reality. And, it, and, it, and it, it's just like everybody else in Europe who's participating with the Cuban economy, but yet we don't because we have, we're saying we're not going to participate more, but really, which comes to economic moral issues. I'm saying, you know, we're not going to deal with them. We have sanctions against them. Everybody else benefits from it, and they take, they totally exploit it, and they get off the hook from not being imperialist. Well, don't, don't forget, that you, were, you were speaking about, uh, um, you know, that everybody can benefit from each other. And then on Twitter, I was talking about uh, functional analysis, right? How the society right. is a unit and every other subpart, basically, you know, they, they, uh, they're they interrelated and they work together to, uh, to benefit the whole, right? Well, right. we're just not a unit within a country, right? Like the United States, everything functions within it, but we also function within uh, with other nations as well. Absolutely. And we can all But that's not just with the nations. You also have to go out at a micro level. You have to look at the individual and families and people and the cities and states, right? 
And if the people in the city and the states, they're not happy and they're not, you know, prospering, then that also affects everything else. It's kind of like a recursion problem in computer science. You know how you divide the problem and then... Look at you, man! Look like at recursion with your, with your loops and loops and functions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, we we put on Twitter that asked me how to escape a recursion. was somebody asked me, I can't remember on Twitter how to get out of recursion. They had a problem that their, their fourth loop wasn't working or something. Go ahead. Nice. Right. You know, you take the big problem, divide it into smaller problems, and then you just return all the way up, right? Well, that's the same thing with the people. They're at the they're at the level where they're about to return up because everything's going to be connected, right? Absolutely. So that's when we start getting into issues like you know Medicare or, or national health care and education and are you entitled to education stuff like that. But the thing is that if we have a massive population of people that are sick or are stupid and you know not educated, then it's not going to benefit anyone. So, I don't know, maybe at a philosophical level, people are entitled to an education and to be healthy as well. I'm not saying give them money and maintain them, but what I'm saying is that you can't die, and you have to be smart so you can contribute to the society as a whole. And that should happen everywhere, so that everybody can be smart and everybody can contribute to the society. And, and let me say with that, and it's something I had told you before, Jonathan, is that economics exists because it does care. If we didn't care, we wouldn't, we wouldn't make a study of how to distribute and manage scarcity and inequality from raw materials to its production. I, 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 I'm not sure care is the right word to use. No, it is. It, no, exactly. no, at the end of the day, it's it's economics being self-serving. Because well, yeah, if it doesn't do that, it, beings, it implodes. Human beings being self-serving, which comes back to we care how we survive. If we did not, if, it's, it's like the context of saying, it's, it, what, I, what I want to put down what I want to put forth is that I respect a, a, an economic model that comes up so long as it respects the economic models of scarcity and inequality at all levels, that it wants to help people. All economic models want to help people. Uh, That's okay, I, I have to ask you a question now then on that though. What if the economic model is built on the idea of believing it can um, use innovation to lessen or in time uh, eliminate scarcity where the supply is met. I, nothing wrong with that. You know, now you're getting into zeitgeist. That's what I was talking about. So, okay, Elmo will laugh on the floor. Let's do Star Trek because that's a future. Where, it's a zeitgeist uh, future. But this is why I want to. This is why I want to figure a way to work the zeitgeist in. Wait a minute. Why does <laughs> Why does the Federation of Star Trek not have money? They fictionally solve the problem of scarcity and inequality. They have replicators and all this. It's nice to write it in sci-fi and say, I don't have a scarcity, I don't have an inequality. What people don't understand is just not raw materials. There is an inequality in how we distribute, an inequality in actually how we consume. And if you have inequalities even at the consumer level, which is you and I, we have a real problem in managing an economic model. When you do away with it and make something so surplus and marginal, which you do in Star Trek fictionally by having replicators, like, if you drop a cup of coffee and break the glass and the coffee spills all over the place, you simply replicate another one. And that's an endless, infinite cycle, essentially, according to Star Trek. Therefore, you don't need money. You've eliminated the means to want to distribute it. Well, what, the, what that is that you, it's like, um, I don't know what your name is, because you have N.A., so... <laughs> His name is Rusty. Okay, Rusty. So, like Rusty was saying, that... Um, uh, no, I just had like the, I don't know, brain fart. <laughs> uh, okay, continue and I'll remember. All right. Well, so the thing of it is, is, is that, is that what I argue about mostly in economics is my favorite word, which Rusty always gets on my back about opportunity, <laughs> because that's what it comes to. When we say somebody's suffering on the street, our initial emotion is to, look, I want to help them immediately. Let's use central planning because we, we, we usually, it's, it's funny that a lot of us dismiss the local, which is ourselves, and go immediately to saying we need to make a policy that helps that person. Whereas more times than not, I have stopped this stuff from doing that, and I have participated many times. I don't give much of my money. I don't believe in giving much of my money. I give a tremendous amount of my time to charity. I volunteered for a tremendous amount of efforts that, are, that help people. I feel that my time is much more valuable in execution and efficiency than giving some chump agency my money which then dwindles down probably to 18% of, of that donation actually helping uh, the people on the ground. And, and I, I, do, 
I do. I, I do care deeply about helping, and I feel that when I discuss economics, that my oh, oh no, Pe people would hate my official stance on that because I, I'm very callous and cold when it comes to that. I only believe in helping, which means I, as a general rule of thumb, do not believe in charities. I do not believe in handouts. I do not give handouts. I give help or nothing at all. I'll give a hand up every day, but I will not. I don't believe in charity. I don't believe in just giving a handout for, to give a handout to be all lovey dovey and kind. I don't believe in it at all. Well, connecting to what uh, Rusty was saying before that I remember, right? He was saying about self serving and stuff like that. Uh, you, and you were talking about redistribution. Well, the thing with it is, uh, the thing is that um, basically you're just going to want to survive. That's basically the essential. That's why it's self serving, because that's what capitalism is all about, right? So when you, your family needs food, you're only going to care about your family. But when somebody else is dying, yeah, it tends to be more of like Iron Rand says, which I really dislike because she's like to the extreme where she, I don't even think she cares about anyone. But anyways. <laughs> she cares about the press. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Right. But basically it, it comes down to saying, well, how important are they? But I mean, most individuals, they're like, oh, I wish I could do something about them, but eh. I don't have the time or I don't want to give my money or whatever, then they don't do anything and that people end up dying. So I mean, that, that's that's where that's what I'm saying, that individualism is good and everything, but we're all connected and having a central planner uh, on something like that, where it's not that you know they're robbing all of our money like some people say. Well, and, and what, what you're getting into is the fact that people are very empathetic, but they're also... It, it, I find humans really... What, what you're getting, yeah, no, 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 that's the thing. They cl they're, they're, they're empathetic in that they care, but they're apathetic in their action. And at okay. the end of the day, I, 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 I'm, I'm generally wired the exact opposite. Yeah, I, I I'll say some of that. The United States is not apathetic in terms of charity. We have one of the... You know, when, you, when, you, when you're when you in this country, it's like my mother-in-law who comes to Guatemala. She is astonished at the amount of help in organizations that are totally based on charitable donations exist in this country that don't exist in her country. The American people are very generous. And the way you get people to be generous is to create massive amounts of surplus. If we go the opposite direction, and this is what I get at in terms of execution, and we start saying, by policy, I will take this away, we make it equally poor, which I know is a very general summarization, but it is a, a result that occurs when we put too much central planning involved for a good intention that initially kills the very idea that we're after. Now, I don't believe that people are, uh, because I witness it every day that are not that oh, apathetic and saying, I'm going to let this person die. Hell no. Now, I am very disturbed, ironically, in, in the, uh, what is the, Kong, the, the Kwandong province of China, which I'm now just trying to overcome where this two-year-old girl gets run over by a truck and then 18 people pass her and then gets run over again. Uh, you know, uh, not, yeah, there are some cities in the U.S. that are like that, too. <laughs> you show me. Because, see, I don't, I don't make them look of it. I, if, if it exists, fine. Then I will, I will eat my words. But, but um, the, I, what I'm talking about, I, we have racism where we drag people, yes, you know, like in Texas and all that. This is about indifference. Hate, hatred towards the person is very different than indifference. There was 18 people that had indifference to this two-year-old girl. And a lot of it comes from what I was arguing is that when you get too centrally planned, everybody is equal and the individuality and the aspiration to being something better than your fellow man is gone and therefore what is the quality of anything? But that's a the thing is, you're looking at it in an idealistic world. I'm happy that, you know, like, there's charities and stuff like that. But when you have critical, when you, when you have critical life values, like like a healthcare or sickness and stuff like that, mm -hmm. those things should not be taken care of for, by charity. You should not wait until charities come up. Okay, great. I agree. I agree. Okay, so you don't want it to be on the behest that, that we should have it there. All right. But how do we achieve that? And, 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 and that is the real question. Okay. We can have central plans, which exist in other countries, that have very poor rates of return as well. UK, which was NHS, which they have they dedicated tremendous amount of resources to, on paper, having, if you have a problem, 
we'll take care of you. Well, okay, but see, th- th- this goes to like what you're. Th- you volunteer, so you you um you have a. In my opinion, most people who volunteer tend to have a. They tend to think people are better than they tend to be. They tend to think people are not as apathetic as they tend to be. But 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 the reality is, most people are more comfortable giving half the money in their bank account than walking out their door and doing one day's worth of actual contribution. They're still giving charity, whether it's a volunteer or economic. But now, the problem that I have is that, that that charity that they give, which is, let's say, 25 bucks, translates to maybe 6 bucks going to the actual result. Nonetheless, they gave. What I'm saying is that in the United States, we do give a lot. But in other countries where they don't have surpluses, the charity is extremely rare to find. We give Whether a lot to who? Huh? We give a lot to who? Ourselves. How many organizations exist? We have, we have the most frivolous charity organizations that help, like, with tattoo removal, for instance. We, there is everything under the sun. <laughs> there, there's a Dilbert where they made fun of that. Like, one of the charities that was going around, hi, would you like to give to a charity for guys that don't have satellite TV? <laughs> this country is so filled with people. I, I, I don't know why they make this blanket. They don't, they're not looking. This country is the most absurdity in terms of charity. When you have these charities, you think that charity should replace essential functions of life. I did not say that. I'm. We are we are talking about principle of people and individualism. You're saying okay, why well, should they not care? I'm saying that if I supply a surplus to that individual, they will care. Now that that was my kind to your argument. Now we're talking about a, what you are getting at in terms of health care. Well, that's what I was getting into with NHS. You can make mandates and policy, even taking Japan. Let's take Japan as well. That where you have either bankrupting hospitals that they close, or too few doctors, uh, or just denial of service. Even though on paper it says that hey, you're there. Now what what do I mean by denial of service? They keep changing the laws. They keep changing the laws, just saying, oh well. And that's what I hate. See, that's what I'm trying to get across to you is that. When we allow it to the central planners and it's a few people in charge, we all become numbers. And all they say is that, you know what? Let's change the retirement age to 65. Let's take this health this health provision, this health provision, and this health provision off, and they're going to have to meet X, Y, and Z criteria, and bam, because after all, we have a budget to meet. So well, you know, and you, you brought up social. It, it's kind of off topic, but uh, of, those, uh, of those of us here... Uh, now, I have a question. Of those of us here, do we think, uh, how many of us honestly think that they're not going to change the rules on Social Security so that they're hedging for us to die before they have to pay us? I, I'm what, just... Well, what the concern that I have with Social Security, and what the Republicans were partially right on, is yes, there's a trust fund, but also Obama exposed, uh, and it's quite true, is that if we don't make budgets, then checks don't get cut. Because the trust fund is an investment, and then taking investments in liquidity is a very different thing. The, the, the trust fund was originally, and, and we did it quite smartly, under that plan is saying we have a population spike at this point. Which we, after all, but when these baby boomers die off, our population will is, is exponentially decreased. The world population is on a decrease, massively. Which people, don't, uh, which people should actually fear more than about oh no no! Everybody's obsessed right now with the world population hitting ten trillion. Excuse me, ten billion. You know, they're 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 yeah, they're not paying attention to the fact that yeah, yeah our parents did not yeah. have this boom of kids. Short uh-huh. short of another war and another baby boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, if not, no baby boom occurs by twenty fifty, we could have culturally severe differences in the way the world functions from today. But just from the die off of people. But I, I went off topic. What I'm getting at. Speaking about the, the individualism again and, and, uh, and the, you know, the connectedness of people, right? It's a, it's a social contract, though. That's the thing that I'm trying to get at. And that's a, of course, we have a democracy. You know, we have a republic. So people's no, we have a republic, yeah, I'm going to say. <laughs> well, yeah, the UK does not have a constitution. That's a democracy, uh, a democracy is, you know, obviously is when a lot of people go and stuff like that on issues. But. Uh, a republic is a representative democracy. That's what it is. You have much of a democracy as well, but it's still a democracy. Correct. Right. So, for the social contract, if you're a human being, right, and you're individual, 
no problem, and you're living with other people, you're not bound to the people. Well, your variables, you, I would put it this way, your variables and what you do have a heavily exponential variable output result to how you interact with everybody. That is very true. And that's why I'm saying, I don't disagree with your premise. I am only discussing on how we execute in helping those people. Right, and, and that's, that's the thing that if everybody says, if everybody votes in, in every, you know, different states or whatever, I mean, I like state level as well, but when it comes to issues that big, uh, no, why, why, why give it to the federal authority? Let it happen in your state because your state, your state has so much more power in addressing your specific problems than the federal government does. Right, I, I completely agree with you because, I mean, oh. obviously the people living in the neighborhood would know what's best for the people in the neighborhood. Because exactly. They live there. Right, I know what you're saying, but, I, it, the, all right, the minimum power that I would give the federal government is that the federal government has to mandate that every single state has a solution for these problems. And then I'll leave it at that. Then oh, okay, no, no, I, I, I have to cut on you on that because once you create a federal mandate, that's the problem we have with the edu education system right now. We have a federal mandate for a minimum standard, so as a result, the Fed authority is dictating, the, they're creating a box in which the local schools have to function, right. otherwise they're not a school. Once you create a federal mandate, you've, you've you, like what... Uh, Marcel was saying you create a counter box which basically prevents what you're trying to create because you have to live in the federal box. Right, but the problem is though that you're looking at it as if it was an exam, like, oh, everybody has to get a 65. I'm talking about life issues here. Like, everybody can, you know, like... Yeah, but, but Jonathan, even if you make a central plan, you can have the, still the same result. But that's what I, I brought up in NHS in Japan. We still have failures, massive failures in the UK and Japan that have greatly central plan, totally central plan, healthcare plans that we're advocating, and if those people die, what is the excuse at this point? We right. went the central plan route, their their hospitals are closing, they, uh, and these are two different countries that have two different problems. Japan has very cheap prices, and they, and, and, and they but they have failing hospitals, NHS has problems with beds and so on. I mean, it, it, the thing of it is, is that the United States, which I get pissed off about, is that both parties, Democrat and Republican, don't even understand the issue. One argues that I want to centralize the costs into the government. The other argues, let's put it onto private insurance. Hello, both are fun. Are, are, I don't like this. Oh, 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 okay, oh, no, no, Marcel, I, I don't think you're giving them enough credit. I think they fully understand the issue. The issue is... People are not educated. People don't understand what the real yeah, problem yeah. is. And well, if we if we no, tell no, them, no, 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 it's it's this versus this, th then they're like, well, I'm for this, not that, you know. And they tell they tell. Th you have got to be kidding me with the kind of crap that comes out with some of these politicians. The, not, neither plan makes it more affordable in this country. I know that. None of those plans. Whether we make a universal health care plan. All you're doing is passing the financial expense the insurance company's experience to the federal government, which will do, of course, do a worse job because it's fewer people in charge. R whether it does a worse job or not, like you're saying, it's passing that cost to the federal exactly. government, which, ultima which ultimately passes that cost directly to every taxpayer. We have a severe problem in this country that we need to address the real cost of health care. That means... That the poorest person, healthcare becomes a commodity. Our objective in this country is to marginalize healthcare so that it is extremely affordable at all levels. Then, if somebody is truly poor and really and, and they're just out of money at that point, the cost to the society of which I'm willing to be taxed for is at a much lower level. It is a much more efficient level and a less wasteful level. Because my first prompt was to, I addressed the real problems. Let's lower the costs of health care. Not with central planning and not with private insurance. There are many more problems in health care of why it is more expensive that need to be brought to bear in our versus this crap that both Democrats and Republicans uh, are giving. Uh, okay, but there's three problems with your philosophy. A... Uh, you're looking at it from an analytical standpoint, which, you know, we can't do. These are human beings we're talking about. We can't look at it analytically and quantifiably. Let me finish. Then problem two is that uh, if you do that solution, it's it, you're actually providing a solution and working the problem, and then a party can't claim credit, which they don't get the political gain of claiming credit. 
they will get credit because look, number one, number one, let me say, it is already happening in the United States. We are actually starting to uh, mar uh, modulize healthcare, and it's uh, actually in Texas it's happening a lot. We're getting a lot of smaller, smaller, smaller clinics that are becoming uh, and addressing smaller, smaller types of, of treatments. And yeah, you're talking about the non-emergency aid clinics. That's not just in Texas. They're coming. I know. Yeah, I know. those primary care places or whatever. Yeah. yeah they're popping up. It's beginning to happen, and all we need to do is help that happen. We need to start. We need to start making different classes of doctors. We need to de we need to de or not de but separate pharmaceuticals from healthcare totally. Pharmaceutical drugs needs to be in its own world, and healthcare services needs to be in its other world. I know that doesn't that people are like what? What's the same? Yes, because a a a drug is a physical com it's not a service. It is a physical commodity that you take like you would buy a Campbell's soup. Now, of course, now people are going, like, oh my God, this. It can do so much to your body. Yes, I understand that. The thing <laughs> is, it, 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 it's it's a dynamic commodity, but it is still a commodity. <laughs> it is a commodity. What I have to do is disconnect it from the service. It belongs in the realm of the pharmacy, which is already heavily regulated. I'm not changing any of that. What I'm saying is that doctors will have less influence of what you purchase in terms of prescriptions. Therefore, the lobbying that occurs between the commodity and the service is broken down, which at that point, we can then go to the FDA and say, fine, we now can absorb different classes of drugs like many European countries do, and that you can go into a pharmacy and you have a much more option of choice, which then falls in the purview of the pharmacist and not the doctor. The doctor should say, you need this class of prescription. And it's up to the pharmacist to then say, this class, if you are taking X, Y, and Z drugs, can cause chemical reactions. That, 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 would also, that, that would solve the problem you're talking about also of people getting different drugs from different doctors that should never be yes, mixed. Absolutely. Because people shop, shop doctors like there's no tomorrow. When you're on a pharmacy, you're on a centralized computer because it's a private company like Walgreens or whatever. And, and if you are an individual that decides to go to CVS or whatever, okay, well, there, there, are, there are at points when a doctor says you have this class and you have these other types of, you have these other types of drugs, the private enterprise under computer versus, versus doctors, because they're under HIPAA laws, cannot disclose, because it becomes a very different world. Secondly, why does a person need to go to an endocrinologist because they have a sinus infection? We are making a whole new class, slowly but surely, that's happening right now, of doctors that can see preemptive medicine at a much lower cost. It's, 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 it's in this agency that's happening right now. That many people, I, I, I know the medical industry. I pro, most of my programming is in the medical industry. That, that will say, you know what, I don't like you. I want to go to this endocrinologist. Okay, well, you know what? That is your choice as a consumer, but it's going to cost you X dollars to go to that doctor because he's your buddy. You're going to, because you physically are taking a seat of a diabetic that needs to see an endocrinologist. So you're going to pay what they pay, you know, what, what they're essentially paying for a specialized service versus you could pay $10 here from a doctor that really only specializes in treating sinus infections. You can pay $10 or you can pay $80. And, you, you were talking about before about humans, healthcare, and commodity, right? right. I don't think that. Well, uh, that explains on how to make healthcare cheaper. Is what I'm saying is that we we need to attack and making. I'm giving you real examples on how to make healthcare cheaper. But the thing it, is, you're looking at it. You're looking at it as if uh, if healthcare is just you know just something that if you can afford then you can get it. But I don't think that. No, no, no. no. Well, you didn't hear what I said. Firstly, firstly, I said we need to make it cheaper. And what, are, what was my second? What was my second statement? That once we have it cheaper, I I said this. I said this. You can go watch the video. Uh, once it's up on YouTube, I said this. Once we have that in place, I am willing to give my tax dollars to help that poor person. Because you know why? It's already at a cheaper level, at a more efficient level, and at a, at a level that's more specific to helping them. I'm right. willing to give my tax dollars. I just want to first break the system to make it cheaper first. Right, but we can break the system without letting people suffer right now because we're still 
There's no, no, you can't. You can't. Trust me, people are already suffering on the Medicaid. Why do you think Democrats are already constantly saying, we have people suffering, we have people suffering, yet we have Medicare, we have Medicaid, we are constantly throwing... Well, I, I, I feel the need to interject because what both of you are getting on is a growing divide in the U.S. right now, which is there's a growing number of people who have uh, whose official stance is the well is dry until you're in order, and then there's other people who are, but the well, it, 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 we don't have to destroy everything to put the well in order. We just need to fix the well, and, and I can see the arguments from both sides, but at the end of the day, I'm... Yeah, it, 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 it. If you don't change the costs, if you don't change the costs inherently, then passing the buck to the federal government does nothing for you. It well, and, and that comes down. The debate is: Do you think you can restructure a broken system? Oh, Why funding it, or do you think you need the correct of basically bankrupting the current system to then build no, a new? No, actually, actually, we look here, and here's a realistic thing. No matter what politicians tell you that are Republican or Democrat, they're on there. You're not going to change things how the money is budgeted right now in Medicaid and Medicare. That's we well they are. I, well, I, let me let me take that back. They are actually changing laws and, and thresholds currently. But you know what? It's going to get worse if we do not change the cost of health care. I mean, really change the cost of the cost of health care. Then the thresholds of Medicare, whether it's under a, a universal plan of the government or a private insurance, is going to make it worse. Okay, right. and, and then we're going to experience problems like Japan and Canada, where and, and the UK, where we don't have enough hospital beds, which we have plenty right now. We don't have enough doctors, which we have plenty right now. Uh, or, 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 basically, the you know. It's, I thought we had a mass doctor shortage. We don't. Not in this country. That's what. That's the. Uh, uh, do you know how many ads I see every day? We're yeah. short on doctors. Yeah. More people go to medical school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tactics. Those are scare tactics. And per capita, and, and how we compete in other countries. We so the thing of it is, is that one reason why the United States healthcare costs are so large is because we have one of the largest outpatient options known to man. We have so much in outpatient options that costs because we give we we actually have tremendous amount of choice in outpatient options. Uh, that that is a huge amount of the cost, um, which is fair if we put it under. If we marginalize it and make it a commodity of the choice. Jonathan, what I'm getting at is I don't disagree with you in helping those people. What I'm disagreeing with you is is that if we take the current system and pass the buck, I don't give a crap if the Republicans take it or the Democrats take it. It doesn't change anything. We are going to have the same problems with people dying. Uh, uh, I don't I, I, I don't think, I don't think people are dying as prevalent as, as the media, as the Democrats or Republicans would like to purport. But we are going to have failures. Let me put it this way. We're going to have failures, whether we give it to the government or the, or the private sector, until we start breaking down the system, which is why I say it's a two-pronged approach. Part of it is already happening. Part of healthcare is already responding. It's happening right now. It's in this, and that's why I just brought it up. It's, it's in this nascency. We are beginning to begin to modulate healthcare and commoditize it. It is happening. It's very slow right now, and it's not it's not making mainstream media, but it is happening in many states. The thing that I'm saying is, let's help that, so that when it comes time to the person that Jonathan is talking about that truly needs help, guess what? It costs less in tax dollars to treat them. Yeah, but, at time, but at the same time, for that person that's currently suffering right now, look, I, I mean, humans are born in the world, obviously. And I think that they're entitled to their life. Now, I'm pro-choice, though. So uh, I'm going to define life as after you're actually out of the womb, okay? <laughs> um, but once you're on Earth, you're entitled to your life, and that means that you get sick, you need to be taken care of. And I don't think that a, 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 a hospital should be able to deny your service. You need to be treated. And right. I hospitals don't deny your service here in an emergency uh, case. That's an act of treatment. Right? Actually, it's federal law that no hospital can deny you yeah, service. Yeah. That's a myth in this country. You actually cannot really be denied. E even to the point where you know, where Texas and why Rick Perry, I hate how they lambasted him, that Rick Perry um, has this binational plan because you, you know how many Texas hospitals treat illegal immigrants free? For free. They should be this free. And, well, we do. And you know how, and see, Perry didn't shut them out, did he? Perry instead said, now I know this goes against the grain of many Americans that don't understand it that it is not the place of a state to deport people. Perry cannot physically deport anybody. 
You didn't invest. There's a law between Arizona and the federal government. Until that's hashed out by law, we can't do anything yet. So what does Perry do? Is he says, fine, it's costing my taxpayers as much money on the current way of doing it. And I hated Mitt Romney for bringing up the binational plan because that idiot had no idea of what Rob, or Perry was trying to do. Perry is saying, as a state, they're already in my state. I can't deport them. My, the laws are preventing me from doing these things, and it's costing me tax dollars. How, I want to bring a free market approach to handling the illegal aliens that come into the hospitals that cost the taxpayer less, but yet still treats them. And that's what the bi-national plan is. It is actually a market-driven healthcare plan that was an experiment allowed by Perry to say, hey, let's actually see how this medicine and health services operate under a free market condition. And guess what? It's treating a lot of patients that are, un are unable to pay, costing taxpayers less dollars under that experimental plan. And yet, here we have these other Republicans that go, oh, screw you, Perry. You were this and this and this and this, and have no idea, are totally naive to what he was actually trying to do in allowing this experimental plan to happen by national. And it's the same thing that happened with the tuition plan. He's talking about children that are brought by illegal immigrants that come in with their parents that have no authority in doing whatever they want. Economically, you can argue, and Jonathan, you're going to appreciate what I'm about to say. Economically, as an economist, you can say, do I let them live off the dole, or do I make them productive? What am I supposed to do? Dream. Now, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, it's like, as an economist, you say, if I don't make them productive, they are an exponential factor variable against against my tax plan. And, and that's why Perry keeps standing up there and saying the federal government failed at the border. The federal government failed at the border. And, no, and it goes over everybody's freaking head because nobody gets it. The states can't kick people out. The federal government does that. And if they're in your state, what are you supposed to do? Just let them pay for their taxes, or let's let them contribute to the uh, contribute to the economy. Perry is saying, "I'm not going to take the adults, but the kids, which had no choice, they come here because their lives have been already chosen for them by their parents. The federal government's not deporting them; they're here. I can't." That they well, and, and honestly, I don't agree on the immigration thing with the idea of we're going to punish the kids for the rest of their life for a decision their parents made on their behalf. Exactly, exactly. And, you, and guess what happens? These kids become documented. It's actually an exponential cost to the United States when we don't document people because they are no longer liable in many cases of our law where they can contribute economically to a, you know, as a factor to our economy by keeping them in that position. So Perry's like, I can't do anything about deporting them. They're costing us tax dollars. i got to make them help contribute back to this economy. Because they, number one, had no... They aren't the criminals. They were, bought, they were brought here without their choice as a child. And now, you know what? It, it, it economically makes more sense to educate them on a smaller cost than keeping them exponentially on the, you know, on the taxpayer's dole and make them productive. Number one, what have I done? I've taken them from illegal status and make them legal because now they have to be on a path to becoming a resident and a citizen and then I'm educating them and they're going to become an economic worker inside the state of Texas and produce. Why is this a problem for many Republicans? Economically, I have no idea because the current circumstances dictate we can do nothing as a state, and uh, federally it is there. Now, Brit the, all the, Brit the, the Republicans that are in, in politics, they're just fucking hypocrites, as simple as that sort of comparison. Mm -hmm. So are the Democrats. Na na name me a politician that isn't a talking head uh, hypocrite. They, they basically, they will say whichever way the wind's blowing. So same thing with the Democrats. They're just two sides of the same point. It doesn't really matter. That's why I like my politics. Out of all yeah, but, I know, I know, but, but the reason why I do like Rick Perry is because the state, all Rick Perry has to say is that, look, what's good for Texas may not be good for the Arizona, but what I would do as president is empower the states to manage their immigration the way they want to. Well, the uh, um, sorry for bringing the topic a little back, right? But sure. um, uh, I was talking about um, the healthcare costs and stuff. And yes. Stuff. Right? I wasn't looking at it as the United States has a law, I was just saying that in a philosophical way, humans shouldn't be denied service. Right. 
They, they, they aren't. If you if you show up in any ER in the U.S., you, 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 it doesn't matter. Who, it doesn't matter even if you're an uh, illegal immigrant, you will be provided medical service right. to the ability right. of the facility. So the real argument, where, 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 I think, where I think it is, is that once you get treated, right, because you have to get treated, you can't be in debt. You, that can't be a liability because you're entitled to your life. They that's don't collect, true. Jonathan. They don't. I, 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 actually, that's not always the case. In fact, a lot of ERs... They don't. They won't even give you a bill. They bill directly to a collection agency, and you find out how much the bill is when they report it to your yeah, credit yeah, report. Yeah, yeah. For, wait, 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 wait. Let me say yeah, because let me explain it. I've lived through credit collection and settlement. And credit it's an unsecured debt. They can't do anything. Exactly. To you. Now, if you live in a state that's more liberal, that happens to because Texas protects us individuals. If we, if if someone does go to the state of Texas and gets treated, there's no really recourse for the hospital. I don't care if they threaten you with red letters and all that. They can't really do anything to you. They can't even garner your wages. Now, if you live in all they can, office, they can. Uh, and, and, no, no, and so there is one thing they can do in Texas. They can what? go get, they can sue you, get a judgment, and they can seize your bank account. Oh, what they do? Like, they have a bank account. You know how many people that I know in low income that don't have a checking account? I, I know, but basically the only thing that no state exempts is now, bank. Uh, other states that allow allow those entities like California to garnish your wages. How unfair is that, which is a liberal state? Well, I don't like that stance either. That's why when it comes to like uh, college tuition, see this, okay, you'll appreciate this, Barzal, okay? When you have a uh, tuition money, you know, people loaning stuff, uh, you know, loaning people money, and then uh, let's say that 10 years pass and you're like in a huge amount of debt, right? Even if you declare bankruptcy, you still can't get rid of that federal debt. I know. With fa well, no, that's the real problem with student loans right now. Because what we have done is we have exempt any protection under the law for if you can't pay the money for student loans. You can't file bankruptcy. You can't get rid of it. You basically, federal or private, they've turned what are basically credit card debts into exempt debt. Yes. When I, when I graduate from college, I'm in my third year right now. When I graduate, bachelor's degree, I'm going to be like 40 to 60 in debt. And I don't even know and dude, you got a cheap degree. Most people are graduating with a hundred K plus. Wait, wait, wait. It costs you forty thousand to go to school in the US? It, 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 dude, it costs the average uh, college student on a bachelor's degree right now has somewhere between forty and hundred and fifty K in debt. They're living in long states, man. Well the thing yeah, is I'm going to take the bait and it doesn't even cost anywhere near that, even if you get a loan. No, 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 no. And, and, uh, and t Texas has a program, which is if you went to school, if your primary school education was in Texas and you managed to get in the top percent of your graduating class, you actually get this, oh, dear God, tuition bill from Texas to pay for going to a Texas school. Uh, uh, not even that. I mean, I'm talking about if I paid cash to my university that I went to. Uh, uh, when did you go to school, though? Bit in the last ten years, the price of college has doubled almost every two to three years. See, and I have a problem with that. And we'll get into that's a very long conversation. Let's save the next book for of education because I have a whole in depth. See, I will give people specifics, not just sound bites. I will give you because I love to study this stuff. I will give you specifics in how to tackle this stuff. Now, you can disagree with me and say I'm totally full of crap in how I do it, but I won't give you sound bites. I will actually give you specifics on how to tackle problems that, at least to my summarization, came in how I started it and, and gave you the results. Well, the, the, thing is that, the, the thing is that if I could start college all over again, I would go to community college because it's only like 4.5K, so I'm going to be able to like afford that and not even be in that much debt. The thing is I'm going, I'm going to a, a school where they charge 23K. And it goes up by every year, of course. So, and, and then, and then the government is like giving me like 15k, let's say, with grants and loans, uh, but with a with a final parent plus loan, which they call that. It's like, yeah, and, yeah. and doesn't that miss the problem? God damn it! That's like, well, well how does it miss? No, the I, 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 actually, hold on. I have a bunch of, I have, I have a bunch of statistics on this. Let me. Let, no, 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 I'm gonna say this. Why isn't anybody saying? Why does it cost this much? Instead, we argue grants and loans and all this. What? The, I would go to the university and go, what the F? Okay, this is what? the thing. that it's it, Look, when I started college, I was kind of naive when it comes to this stuff. So I was like, okay, whatever. I'll just, you know, I'll just take out the loan and that's it. But then now that I'm in my junior year, I'm like, how the fuck am I going to pay this? No, no, no. They buy the dream 
of a college gets you a job and most people don't crunch the economic numbers on it. I have some of those numbers here and yada yada and we will go into that in the next part but I gotta pull all those statistics up before we start so I have it all on my fingertips because I have that stuff. I, I can cite like real numbers, cost benefit analysis and, and other stuff. The reality is what you're getting at uh, in many cases, many many cases right now a college degree is counterproductive, unfortunately, because largely of the cost. And that's just, that's not cool. Well, look, look, at, look at Ron Paul's um, uh, plan on this. He's basically like, okay, just take the federal loans. Just take them out, because if, they, if the federal government can't give you the loans, then that means that the you know schools have to lower their price, because who the hell is going to pay 23K out of the pot? Well, no, and, and, well, no, and that, well, no, but see, that's the thing. What he misses is that most of that money is coming from private loan sharks and so on. And uh, the federal loans are part of what raised the price because there are whole institutions that were set up on the premise of getting butts in the seat for freshman flunk out year yeah. to qualify for federal money and Pell Grants and yada yada and so forth. Right, but if the federal government doesn't provide, right, or let's say not the federal government, you can even lower it to a state because, I mean, we have state loans as well. Then when a person that's poor, right, wants to go to a good college and the college costs a lot of money, how's that poor person going to go to college? He can't. He's probably going to have to go to a, a, either a shitty college or obviously a college that just Wait a minute, but Jonathan, we can't make everybody go to the same college. No, no, but I'm saying the opportunity for them because, I mean, it won't. No, 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 yeah. Uh, honestly, uh, a growing problem in this country is people are like in the top percentile. They're, they have uh, 140 plus IQs. They pass all the tests. That you know, they apply to school. School says, "Sure, here's your bill," and then they take a look at it. I can't afford yeah. this. I know, Sorry. That's stupid. And Obama made all the loans now in our bill, so that if Jonathan can't pay it, even in the state of Texas, they can garnish your wages because the federal government. The Almighty that can screw you with no gasoline. Well, and once you get help for a thing, right? I actually have a condition it's called ulcerous colitis. It's just, um, I don't know, it's basically like internal bleeding in the intestines, like ulcers, but if it's, if it's not treated, it can lead to colon cancer, but since I have treatment and Medicaid pays for it because I have straight Medicaid, then I can take that. But the thing is, though, and I also get SSI because of that since I was like 10 years old. But the problem is, once my SSI finishes, I'm planning to get a job anyway, so I'm going to have to like cancel that. Once I lose SSI, I lose my Medicaid as well. And then how am I going to get the medicine as well? That's going to be really expensive for me. I'm not going to be able to afford those medications. Well, and, that, and that's where I get at, is that until politicians get serious on both sides of the camp to actually lessen the prices and not lessen the costs of all these industries, with true plans that do lessen them instead of passing the buck between private sector insurance or insurance doesn't work. Republicans have are, hip are hypocritical in the sense that they say redistribution of wealth doesn't work under a government. Why would it work under a private insurance scheme? It won't either. And, and, government, exactly. and, uh, and businesses regulating themselves don't work either. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why I attack, let's lower the costs. We have to address the costs, physically. And that's what I was getting at, Jonathan, with your health care. This is my first problem, is to attack health costs. So that when somebody really can't afford it, that when I do give my taxes to help them out, the amount of taxes that we pay as a country to helping those people out is far lower, exponentially, than what we are doing now. And that's what I'm doing. Right, so, so what are we going to do about uh, Republicans saying, oh, just let the business regulate this? Because it doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're not well, that's like, why I have a problem, kind of with Rob Paul and saying he's doing it from a federal level still. I like Perry better because Perry's saying if he sticks with it, that's the real caveat. Perry's saying use as much government as you want, so long as it's at the state level. Right. But that means that safety nets won't disappear immediately. Well, you know, at the state level safety nets. Right, but, but Jonathan, Clinton, Clinton already made many things already at the state level, and people didn't even realize it. Medicaid is your state level. Your education is at the state level. A, a, a huge chunk of it. Um, Clinton, in 1994, got rid of AFDC, and we went to PRWROA. 
which is we went we went we went to personal responsibility work reconciliation act. That moved a lot of things from the federal level to the state level. Under President Clinton, a lot of people didn't get it. A lot of your services come from your state. And all Perry is saying is I want to give the states more power and not punish them uh, and cost them more money than need be to let them help their own populations. That's why I like Perry so much. It's the state's rights attribute that if he gets rid of it, I'm no longer interested. He goes he goes down to negative. Because then if he's totally national and all this other credit, it's nothing. If he maintains the state's rights posture, then we are uh, the wake in which we feel of transferring the power to the states is much more palatable. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording right here.